Hi, and welcome to Test Talk. I'm Ed Mobley. I'm here with my colleagues, Justin Sebastian and Justin Hankey. Again, gentlemen, thanks for uh, spending time with our audience. Now, today we're going to talk about performance engineering. Now, we've all heard about performance testing, but performance engineering is a whole different discussion, a whole different, uh, you know, pursuit, no activities, yeah. et cetera, right? So, so let's let's start discussing uh, performance engineering. I understand there are you know, four components of it, and along the way, we'll kind of you know contrast with uh, performance engineering, which uh, many folks in our audience are uh, familiar with. Yeah. So, I'll take a crack at it. So, the way I like to think about performance engineering is being the broader holistic view of performance across the life cycle of, a, of an application or a program where performance testing is a piece of that, one of the four that you mentioned. So starting with performance architecture where we're looking at things like what do we expect? How should the application scale based on the architecture and design of the application? Does, do we think it fits what, what we're expecting it to do, whether it's from hardware, network, et cetera? And then we start moving towards that performance diagnostic realm of, okay, now I'm going to start looking into the results that I'm getting <coughs> at, at a code level, at a, at a function level, at a SQL level, being able to really deep dive into the performance of the application, whether it's in standalone single user testing or whether it's during my load testing. Uh, and then the third one being performance testing, I think we're all fairly familiar with that with load testing, running volume, using automated scripts to, to simulate users. And then the last piece being modeling and capacity of an application. So taking what you learn, modeling it, looking at capacity and future to, to see where you'll be in some amount of time, where you think you'll run out of space, et cetera. Yeah, and this really represents a shift left. When, when you look at application performance, because I'm, I'm sure folks out there are familiar with their circumstance where really performance isn't given a lot of thought. Typically, there's there may be no formal performance testing at all. I mean, I know many times, you know, I've, I've been called in by clients where they implement an application and only then do they realize that there are issues with performance and then it becomes a bit of, of a forensic effort to figure out, you know, All what Black Friday events. And well, yeah. well, exactly. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I've, I've worked with clients where, where there are certain decisions uh, that were made early on that are intractable and they have a very, you know, difficult uh, decision to make. But again, this represents mm -hmm. shift left. So, you know, of those components you described, uh, where, where would you like to start? Uh, I guess I can I can take that one. You know how how I've seen it done on some of the projects. So, um, like just was saying earlier, uh, performance architecture is really that first piece of it, right? So part of it is kind of the things you're probably used to, like NFR gathering, non-functional requirement gathering, scenario development, all that type of stuff. But the point is to do that early on, so that um, you know really non-functional requirements really should be a part of the requirements writing, user story writing, everything up front, right? Then the developer understands, not only do I need to make it perform this function, but it needs to perform it in this way, right? So that they don't have to later go back and re-architect it like you, like you mentioned. Um, and so that also enables that performance architect to understand the holistic design and the architecture of the system being built to make sure there's no red flags, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary, things that we've seen don't work well, things like that. Um, and so that can be done uh, very early and, and fits in very well with kind of the agile and, and DevOps, like typical processes. Um, the, the second one, performance diagnostics, um, I think is the, the first opportunity to start to understand and diagnose performance issues early on. So that's the opportunity in Sprint to understand how individual pieces are performing well, so that later when you get to performance testing in the more traditional sense, that's really about load. Can I scale? Can I handle a thousand users? But before that, you need to understand 
can a single person log in and then not take 60 seconds? Mm -hmm. Does the search function complete in a reasonable amount of time? Those are all things you can do, just a single person, just making sure that it performs well, so that when you get a performance testing, it's really, okay, now I know it performs okay, I don't have like long running SQL, it's just about can I handle 1,000 users or 10,000 users or whatever. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting because a lot of folks can tell you, I mean, there was a, a human interface study done 40 years ago that just to, to really simplify, it's like, you know, if some human interaction with an application takes longer than two seconds, that's when people start to feel that it's, it's slow. Yeah. So, uh, okay, you obviously want it to, to get below that. And then, you know, there may be other critical path items that could be, you know, certain batch jobs or processing and stuff like that. And that's, and that's really easy to understand, right? People, people could, you know, easily lay that out. But I think where the, where the real challenge is, is that, you know, as you are building that application and you're looking at things like a particular interface or, or the database or, or any component, how do you kind of work, you know, backwards uh, you know from that because uh, nobody's nobody's going to argue that say six seconds is going to be considered fast right I mean everybody's used to you know sub second response time so you know how do you you know prognosticate that how do you build that into what you do what, what are those additional activities that that could be occurring or should be occurring if you really want to shift left <laughs> and as we've seen sometimes just don't occur yeah I think one of the concepts we use is called what I call a performance budget, but there's a bit of time that, that's spent at the beginning of these projects, right? A lot of times we have these NFR requirements that just says by default, everything needs to be sub-second. And then we go through the whole life cycle of a project and we get to the end and they're not sub-second. The reality is they pro they may never should have been sub-second. Mm -hmm. And we can do a lot of that work up front with gathering those NFRs, but also helping set some expectations around these are the types of transactions. There may be buckets of things. These are very simple, just navigational things where we don't have to go to any of our integrations. Those types of things are sub-second. Everybody nods their head and then we say, okay, now we're pulling account data back. This goes down to six systems. We know already that these things take X amount of times. This isn't sub-second. This is now a four-second thing. Everybody says, makes sense. Four seconds is our expectation. But you early you start setting those expectations with the business and with the users to say, here's what's realistic, let's all make sure we're on the same page. We can't just have a blanket one second guideline that we see a lot. And we have a we actually have a goal to meet that's more reasonable. Um, and then we can have those harder discussions early. I think when I think about performance testing it, and I think about the testing V model, performance testing is way over on the right side on the end of this V model, mm -hmm. right? And typically, when you start planning for these testing events, you should plan on the left side at the same place that you get to on the right side. So that means performance testing should be one of the first things you plan. And what we find in performance testing is a lot of your issues are larger, big issues, fundamental design, <coughs> architecture decisions, yeah. network decisions, things that were made really early on that are hard to undo, you said. so. We got to start talking about those soon, and we and we want to start testing them and checking them as soon as we possibly can to see if we have an issue. Because if we get to the end, these types of issues aren't, you know, a, a defect of make a couple little code changes. A lot of times, they're much broader fixes or changes that have to be made in the architecture. Well, and and, and uh, it's good that you mentioned that, right? Because some of the uh, applications that are, that are being implemented at, at our clients and, and in other organizations, they have to interface with a broad range of, of legacy systems. So in many ways, you're, you're hamstrung in, in certain respects. And I think it, if I understand you right, it's good to know that, hey, listen, we're, we're, we're just not going to get to sub-second performance here. Let's understand that. And, and sometimes, I mean, we've all seen these in, in applications where you perform some activity and it's telling you, hey, you know, we're getting you the best deal, or you're maximizing uh, your shipping, or something like that. So then, at least the user knows, hey, okay, the, the application things. hasn't crashed or hung sure. up. I'm not going to close my my browser session. So I would imagine it's discussions like that that Absolutely. are occurring early on, getting buy-in, as opposed to like, wow, this thing is slow. That's right. Uh, how do we explain <coughs> this? 
Yep. Yeah, absolutely. We see that uh, pretty continually. And, and just back to the theme, this, the sooner we start talking about that, the better. And sometimes you may have that conversation and say, we know these legacy systems are going to take five seconds. The business may say, that's still unacceptable. Then we say, okay, then we need to make some fundamental changes to architecture. And that's when you want to do it. You want to do it mm -hmm. early before you get all, all the way through with your development if you, if you absolutely need to make those changes. So minimizing the surprises. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so so what you're, you know, have been discussing here, we've been discussing are a lot of the uh, preventative uh, activities. So so let's talk about those in, in a little more uh, detail. Yeah. So um, so when it comes to performance diagnostics, there's some kind of more proactive work you can do, right? So um, if you think about some of the single unit or single user or unit level performance testing activities we talked about. Um, if you instrument your application with a APM tools or application performance monitoring tools, right? Um, you don't even ha have to kind of do formal tests. It can just monitor the activity and transactions that are happening in lower level environments, right? So it doesn't have to be you know, a separate environment with separate data and a separate timeline. It can just leverage what's already happening in that environment. And that can tell you a lot about, um, you know, particular pieces of code taking long or database calls or whatever it is, that can tell you a lot. And when you instrument instrument at that level, um, that gives the developers very specific feedback on what's wrong. So instead of saying, you know, page X is taking too long, it'll say, you know, this exact SQL query is, you know, taking 30 seconds to complete or something. So it's more actionable at that point versus kind of the, the later performance tests that are typically more UI based. And, and again, this is instrumentation that can be put in place during development, mm -hmm. but it's something you would also retain once the, the application has actually been deployed. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, all the way from development to production. I'd say a lot of the issues that we find in performance testing specific to user experience or user response times are things that a lot of times we could see in the dev environment, in the sit environment, and well prior to performance testing, and we start talking about tuning of the database queries or, or tuning of how the, uh, the methods work uh, with each other. Those are all things that we typically see in lower environments. And, and we're not, it's not an ask of a testing team really to go do something. Some of the performance team can do themselves using these tools without involve asking the testing teams to go take timings, and go take response times, and go do this and go do that. It's very like behind the scenes we can just see this. So, so these are activities that even folks that are uh, even developers, right, sure. with, with yeah. the right guidance can, can undertake. Yeah, these, these APM tools, uh, most of them these days, uh, you log in, you see a dashboard that says, here's your 10 longest running queries, right? Here's your yeah. 10 longest methods. And I mean, a, a developer especially, knowing that code can look right at it. Probably really useful. Got it. Yeah. Probably more useful for a developer, honestly, than, than anybody else. Because that's where you're going to eventually go is to the developer, to the database team to help you uh, look at some of those times. And all that, all that information and data that you kind of collect from the beginning all the way through the test cycles kind of plugs into that capacity that's monitor right. or capacity modeling and monitoring piece at the end, right? Because you can use all that data to model different scenarios and, and uh, you know, part of modeling is having enough data to base it off of, right? So having all that information can make it a lot easier and a lot more accurate. So instead of, you know, at the, at the end, uh, you know, as, as you're like in a pre-prod environment wondering, hey, how's this going to perform at this user load? You've actually done that pre-work. You've actually thought about it. So when you actually get to doing the formal performance test, it shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, it should be about understanding in reality, like how it actually scales. And, um, you know, in performance testing, you can't always test every possible scenario that you might encounter in production either, right? So that's where the modeling part comes in. So when you do the performance testing, you might hit your kind of your average, your peak, some kind of, you know, catastrophe type scenario to kind of have a, a good understanding of how it scales. But you can then use modeling to have, you know, different hardware stacks, different you know environments and things like that to understand how it performs differently. And, and how do you inculcate the, this discipline, right? I mean, in, in, in a, let's say a, in an agile development scenario, do you have it as part of a story that we're expecting this level of performance or is there just a story in and of itself around 
uh, performance that pertains to everything that's being developed in that sprint? I mean, how, how, how do you do that? So my thought, is it kind of like stacks up over time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think at the user story level um, and sometimes at the feature level, you have uh, you know, acceptance criteria for, you know, whatever it is. Definition and, of done. Right. And, and so there's definition of done, which is like, you know, I have to do all these things before I can mark it done. Um, and then there's a specific acceptance criteria to say, you know, I accept this story when these things happen. Right. And so one of those acceptance criteria should be, I expect this thing to perform in three seconds, whatever it is. Right. So that, uh, that's the level of, uh, NFRs, that, that can exist and so that's like at the little piece level or the little component level. So I, I think what, where you're going is, you know, how do I get to that all together like concurrent scenario, right? So I think that you, you that's still part of the performance testing that happens later. I think you do have to define what that is, right? That workload model. So it could be in the form of a, of a story um, to kind of document that requirement. It could be something separate. Uh, I've seen it done both ways. I think as long as you start with that beginning piece of defining that performance acceptance criteria, um, that typically goes pretty well because again, when you get to that level of scaled performance testing, it's more about scaling than the individual performance of components, if that makes sense. Yeah, because really, I mean, you know, thinking about it is, is, you know, I tend to see that if things tend to be more front and center, people will pay attention to it because otherwise there's just so much noise and so much detail that if some of these NFRs are buried somewhere, they... They get ignored or missed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I think exactly. the, re the reality is when we're looking at priorities on a program, having the functions work is going to be more important than running the performance test. So it's always been that way, probably always will be that way, but tying all that together and having a, a cohesive plan for performance that as you go, you, you can't put, you can't keep pushing it to the back burner, right? It's, it's, it's a piece of, of the, of the project um, for the entire, for the entire program. Yeah. And I know there's one other area that you, you wanted to talk about as we uh, kind of wrap this up. We, we've talked a lot about performance in terms of user response times when we talk about diagnostics we're usually talking about single user low volume making sure the times are within the expected expectations and we can do a really good job of that by the time we get to performance testing the actual volume testing we can say with some confidence that these are what this is what we see for response times we have a baseline of what it looks like with single users that we can compare that against when we run the load test but I, I see a lot that organizations still wait until the end to run these load tests and something that's been really valuable is finding something that you can run at some volume almost whether it's a POC I think there's some 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 thoughts that the code has to be perfect before we run a load test the reality is that it doesn't and and I don't need to run a full load test I can find something that's that is indicative of what's going to happen in production. There may be one function or two functions yeah. that are like, if this thing works well, we feel we have some confidence that everything else is going to work well. So the earlier that that you can do that, and and there may be some defects still there. It may not work completely, but the earlier you can do that and give some confidence around volume to say, we've constructed this architecture in a way that works, that we're gonna be able to add 1,000 users, 100,000 users, whatever it is. The earlier you can do that, the better. And, and a lot of times that's that's some time in the, in the SIT time frame. So like something in between like single user, single transaction sure. and tens or hundreds of thousands, you can do things in between sure. to make sure things aren't, aren't yeah. gonna be a surprise. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So really the, the key takeaways here is you know, you, you have your, your performance testing, very traditional, people understand that. You have the performance engineering, which tend to be more of the preventative activities uh, based on what you just described here. I mean, some overlap between performance testing and performance engineering, but I, I think you know the key takeaway here is that from a performance standpoint, whether it's your performance testing or, or your performance engineering, there, there really is a need for folks to really shift left in their thinking and, and really start thinking about this stuff ahead sure. of time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, gentlemen, thanks again. Thank you. And, uh,
lot of stuff to, to discuss on this topic. So we have a white paper associated with this video, uh, which you can find uh, in the uh, description below. So again, really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Until next time, we'll see you on Test Talk. Thank you.